Hi and welcome to Biotech Specialist webinar. The year 2021 opens with uh, Salter Osteotomy webinar, children's pelvic osteotomies, and uh, our topic is Activa Screw Cannulated. Uh, today's guests come from Sweden, Dr. Per Lernert and Dr. Henrik Hedelin. They have uh, done studies about the Salter in, in nominate osteotomy and the use of PLGA screws, Activa screw cannulated in that indication. Warmly welcome to you both, uh, Dr. Larnet and Dr. Hedelin. Thank you for coming to the specialist webinar. We are pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Larnet, Dr. Hedelin, please, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie. So, uh, we will share our experience uh, from pelvic osteotomies, fixation with um, PLJ screws, in particular uh, using them in Salter osteotomies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, there are three categories of pelvic osteotomies, redirectional ones, reshaping and salvage. Uh, the first one, redirectional, there are Salter and triple osteotomies that are complete osteotomies, and these are inherently unstable, therefore needs fixation. Then there is the more complex ones like the Gans periacetabular osteotomy with an intact pelvic ring, um, but the acetabulum fragment, or acetabular fragment um, is unstable and needs fixation. Second group is the reshaping osteotomies, that is daguerreotype and similar other osteotomies, where the pelvic, pelvic ring is in continuity and therefore is relatively stable and normally are left without internal fixation. Um, the focus of this webinar will be the Salter innominate osteotomy, which is mostly used for DDH, but to some extent for Pertis disease and some other more odd conditions. In neuromuscular conditions, though Salter is generally considered contraindicated, uh, as well until the age of eight years, uh, since the correction depends on the mobility of the pubic synthesis, which gradually decreases over time. The Salter can be used in isolation or in combination with a femoral osteotomy and in conjunction with open reduction in DDH. And regarding Pertis disease, there is a debate whether Salter is suited or not for improving containment. Preoperatively, it's important to investigate the type of dysplasia and the direction of acetabulate insufficiency. In our department, we use the Salter in younger children uh, for acetabular dysplasia and DDH and to the age of about eight years for Pertis disease or according to preoperative CT investigation. Otherwise, we use the triple osteotomy for older children in cases also with a preoperative CT indicated so, or in cases where it would consider needed for the stability of the osteotomy, like kids with Down syndrome, myeloma meningocele, and cerebral palsy. There are several drawbacks, though. First, they will need removal at the second procedure, which is a source for morbidity for the child and a nuisance to the family. Theater availability is an issue, particularly during the ongoing pandemic, but also before due to lack of staff in our hospital, and I know that's the case in other places as well. Second, migration of KYS, not always as extreme as you can see in the picture, but though, can result in loss of fixation and secondary instability. It also has the potential for severe harm of various intra-abdominal and retroperitoneal structures. Thirdly, the soft tissue problem um, can irritate flexor muscles, frick skin problems, and infections are not uncommon. We use these uh, screws for um, the triple um, osteotomy and salter osteotomy. Um, and we will share a case to show how we do it. It's been successfully used for multiple other locations, uh, except for the pelvis, which we have only experienced from the pelvis. And uh, this kid is a five-year-old boy with residual dysplasia of 
after an earlier open reduction. Um, and we will stress a few points that differs from standard techniques down the line. So we use an oblique ilo angle on incision of beginner type. We split the hypothesis along the LI crest. We dissect periosteally to the sciatic notch. We protect with retractors, but since we don't have proper rang retractors, we prefer to do the osteotomy using a power saw and an osteotome. And our experience is if it's carefully executed and with attention to details, it can be safely done. The classic way is, of course, to do it with the jiggly saw. We harvest the wedge shaped graft vertically or perpendicular to the eyelid crest rather than horizontal, uh, as in the original description by Salter. And we use this harvest site as the preferred entry point for the screws, since there is no need for removal later. They does not have to be superficial. So this entry point, entry areas also allow us to place the screws more perpendicular through the osteotomy compared to the standard entry point on the eyelid crest. This is uh, post-op x-ray. This is how it looked uh, six months down the line. This is another patient um, showing just the technical bits where you have to drill over the wire, thread the canal, put the screw, and then you cauterize the head of the screw flush to the bone. And I will hand over to my colleague, Henrik. Yes, so my dear colleague here has talked about the surgical, surgical technique and the nuts and bolts of it all. And I will now briefly talk about the polymer in question and some thoughts on the evolution of bioabsorbable materials in general. Most orthopedic surgeons have some experience using bioabsorbable materials, be it pins, screws, or any other contraption. But we usually do not pay as much attention to the exact polymer being used. And this is understandable since we are orthopedic surgeons and not material engineers after all. And this fact has been the root of some misunderstanding and confusion because different polymers behave quite differently, both stability-wise and regarding degradation. And this means that we, are, we cannot necessarily transfer evidence or experience from one implant to a similar one. Bioabsorbable implants have been around for quite a few decades now, and one of the first ones was PGA, polyglycolic acid. Now, this polymer uh, degraded quickly and was not very stable. There were problems with sinus formations, etc. And these experiences has marked a few of our older, older colleagues for some time. As a response to the problems with PGA, PLLA, or polylactic acid, with L being one of the isomers, was developed, and PLLA is much more stable, but also degrades much, much slower, which were the traits that were desirable when they were developed. Uh, however, in some studies in humans, you can see the remnants of debris of PLLA implants more than five years, or almost 10 years after surgery, which more or less defies the definition of bioabsorbable, if you ask me. Now, PLGA is a later polymer. It's a compromise. You have parts of lactic acid and polycholic. We are using 85L15G polymer by Activa Screw in, by Biotech in Finland. And this exact composition, 85L15G, is important because the traits of the polymer do not behave in a linear way. So a 50-50 composition would behave quite differently from the 8515. And this is the screw that we're using, the 4.5 millimeter. And you can see that there is a metal head that is initially attached for insertion that's later taken away. And here you can also see that it is cannulated and you use a K wire to create the, to double check the direction before drilling and later tapping. I will now briefly mention two studies that we published in, the, in recent years. Uh, in the first study, we retrospectively evaluated the Salter osteotomies that we did between 2012 and 2018, where 21 children included in that study. 
we firstly looked at the stability of the, osteo of the osteotomy. Uh, did the implants bear the load? Were they sturdy enough, so to say? Secondly, we looked at if there were any local reactions to the bioabsorption, and we looked at if there were any complications that we could find. Now, in the table or the graph to the right, you see the subgroup of DDH cases. There's a preoperative radiograph for the acetabular index, the first postoperative, usually a few days after surgery, and the last one furthest to the right is a minimum of 180 days after surgery, meaning that there were bony healing in all those pelvises. And as you can see uh, in this graph, the acetabular index behaved as expected. The correction was to a large extent maintained in a way that made us feel that this uh, osteotomy was stable. And this is the uh, Perthes subgroup of the study. And all the children had predictable development for their cellular index with one exception, and that's the dotted line there. That's the one collapse that we had. It was a five-year-old child who the first day post-operatively with an epidural fell out of bed and uh, from a height of one and a half meter landed on his hip. So on the first post-operative uh, radiograph, the osteotomy had collapsed. And we did learn to make sure that the side rails were in place after that incident. In this study, we saw no infections and uh, no local reactions to the degradation of the screws. Uh, the second study I want to talk about is focused on the implants themselves. Now, since I mentioned earlier, the different polymers behave differently. And the research on how these implants degrade in the human body is quite heterogeneous. And this is due to the fact that not only is our animal models non-representative and ex vivo studies even less so, but also the size of the implant and the location of the implant is of paramount importance. It is the soft tissue coverage of the bone in question and the age of the patient. And in our case, we are only uh, working with children and they do have a different metabolism and they do have a completely different ability to regenerate bone than adults. We could find no earlier studies on how PLGA screws or any other implants degraded in pediatric pelvis. Therefore, we retrospectively evaluated all the MRIs that had been performed on any of the cases we have in Salter or triple osteotomy where we had used the 4.5 millimeter PLGA implants. What you can see here is a five-year-old child, uh, one and a half year after surgery. And you can still, still see that the cavity from the screw is now filled with a fluid-like substance. This is the same patient four and a half years after surgery. And as you can see that the screw canal is now completely replaced with bone. Small dark and white area in the pelvis is a metal artifact, which I will get back to. We did look at other variables as well. We found no ectopic bone formation. There was no sinus formation. Uh, there were a few small, small cysts, all completely inside the bone. The largest one was 10 millimeters in diameter. And as you can see here also on the fourth line, it was quite common to have small, small metal artifacts. And according to our radiologist, those were uh, small pieces of metal debris left by drilling. And it's common in any case where you drill a hole with a drill bit. If we look at this line, maybe the most interesting one, the tissue of the screw canal, uh, after two to four and a half years, the red boxes, we could see that all but one were completely filled with solid bone, with one exception where only 80% of the canal was filled with bone. So in summary, we dare say that these screws do become solid bone in a pediatric pelvis. Now, the third study that is submitted but yet not published is regarding triple osteotomies. At our department, we perform the triple osteotomy as described by Carlios. And in this illustration, 
uh, you can hopefully once again see that the harvest site that we use enable uh, more degrees of freedom regarding where to insert the screws because we do not need to take them out again. And uh, the rightmost implant is, as you see, uh, KY replaced with the resolvable screw, and the small head of the screw sticking out there is later cauterized, so it is completely flush to the bone. And in this case series of 12 patients, we had no collapses and no infections. There were two small uh, wound ruptures, uh, but they were not infections. Uh, and we found no other complications to the implants, and the osteotomy seemed to stay stable according to our radiographic parameters. Uh, it might also be worth noting that in half the cases, both for the triple and the Salter osteotomy study, we only used a hip spike or a petricast for approximately half of the patient. The rest were all restricted to a wheelchair for six weeks and, of course, no weight bearing. But we did not use a cast for all the patients. Of course, these three studies carry very obvious limitations. They are fairly small, single center, retrospective case series, and um, we do need further evidence to learn more about these implants. Uh, we do, however, feel that our preliminary results have given us confidence to continue with what we're doing. Uh, and I will now uh, let my colleague, Dr. Lana, talk a bit more regarding the pros and cons of these implants. Uh, Resolvable screws um, uh, provide a very good grip, similar to regular screws with, regarding pull-out strength, as well as other mechanical qualities. Um, you have the possibility to choose other entry points rather than the very superficial ones you have to stick to when you use uh, kaya wires that you have to take out later. Um, resorbable screws can be inserted, uh, cannot be inserted further than the pre-drilled canal, and for the same reason, there is no risk for later distal screw migration. Um, since the screw is cut flush with the bone, uh, there is less risk of mechanical disturbances of the soft tissues. Uh, question whether there is a less risk of infection. Well, all in all, we have performed now more than 70 cases with Salter and triple osteotomies uh, with this implant. And so far, we have seen no deep infections, actually. And then on the downside, well, uh, surgery time is longer. You have to drill over the wire, you have to thread the canal, you have to put the screw in, you have to cut the extruding part of the screw. Uh, but the learning curve is rather short, and we expect or appreciate that the additional surgery time is something between 10 and 15 minutes after some training. Cost-wise, uh, uh, in our hospital, uh, using two 4.5 Actiga screws come to about 50% of the cost for a day K procedure that otherwise would have been necessary to take out uh, K wires. As always, it's important to know the indications for an implant as well as uh, um, its limitations. At the end, it comes down to good patient selection. And here is an example where that selection was not so good. It's a five year old boy with Pertus disease who was quite small for his age, as these patients tend to be sometime, with a tiny size on his pelvis. And you can already, on this final uh, fluoroscopy from theater, see that uh, you can suspect a small medial displacement of the distal fragment. So the bone has to be able to accommodate this 4.5 screw for a good purchase of the bone and stability during healing. So here you can see a few days post-op, uh, Medial drift of the distal segment has uh, continued. This is three months down the line. You can see that the correction has completely collapsed and the correction is lost. The learning point uh, from this is, of course, that you have to choose your implant uh, according to patient specifics. And uh, just for information, uh, this patient had his surgery after our published series. Uh, uh, with this said, uh, we will move on to have a brief look at. 
uh, possible future directions of resolvable implants. And I will uh, then pass on the word to Dr. Hedelin. Yes, the future. Well, as you can see uh, by these budding ferns on the picture, there are a lot of prospective implants that will bloom out in the near future. Uh, PLGA has been increasingly used for many fields, and it will be interesting to see the future of this specific implant, but also regarding other implants. There are more polymers being examined and completely different materials like magnesium. We will see what slot they will fit into in the future. Uh, in general, I would like to say that we as pediatric orthopedic surgeons are very fond of K-wires because they solve so many of our problems. But in the future, probably with the right indication, uh, resolvable implants will create equal or better outcomes and it will de-necessitate that second surgery that can be a logistic problem for the hospital and increased morbidity for the and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, uh, Dr. Larnet and Dr. Hedelin. We have uh, received questions prior to the event. Let's go them, them through. And uh, so regarding the patient selection, uh, what is your optimal patient and, and which uh, which patient benefits the most with, from this technique and the implant? Using the resolvable screws, we use it for almost all salt roll triple osteotomies that we do. But as Dr. Larnard's case highlighted, in the smallest children where the pelvis is thin, the 4.5 millimeter screw is probably too thick to gain sufficient purchase in the graft. And there, either K wires or potentially a thinner resolvable implant would probably be a wiser choice. But we have no experience using thinner screws. What are the predominant screw lengths you are using? Screw lengths? It depends on the size of the pelvis, usually between 50 and 70 milli millimeters. Uh, and then you cut it. So the length of the screw is, is completely customized to the length needed. If you, if, you were, if you happen to choose a too long a screw, you just cut it at the edge of the bone anyway. Uh, in your opinion, the main challenge with the technique? Well, um, in, in the, the first couple of cases, um, I was uncomfortable with not seeing the implant, which I think is uh, normally as an orthopedic surgeon, you use your fluoroscopy and you look at the implant because you can't see the screw, but there is a distinct feeling with the screw. And as we pointed out earlier, you drill the hole and you can see the drill bits and you know perfectly well the canal you have created. The screw will not propagate further. You can't drill like, like a, a, a um, metal screw, you can you can actually advance further than the drill hole, but you can't do that with this uh, implant. Uh, do you use any bone substitutes with in this uh, osteotomy? Never. Never. Okay. Never. The, the one of the um, advantages of using the harvest site described in this technique is that you are never really short of bone. You can take the wedge the size you want, and if you want some uh, extra bone, you can use this, the traditional site for bone harvesting as well. And if you close the apophysis correctly, it will all grow back in a matter of weeks and months. I think there will be someone out in the audience thinking that uh, when you do the correction with the isostiotomies, uh, quite often you have to reduce the bone anyhow to be able to fit on the islet apophysis afterwards. And we do that regularly. Um, and then we try to fit in the bone as an extra layer or we throw it away. Um, the last question uh, from, the, from this webinar is, could you go again uh, through the post-operative protocol? We make a decision whether we need to immobilize the hip. If it's a small child, we usually use a hip spiker for six weeks. Or if it is a patient that is not compliant 
with instructions. Uh, then we use a hip spike or in larger children, a uh, Petri cast. Uh, for example, children with cognitive disabilities, we mobilize them, or children that uh, are too uh, young to follow instructions. But in, in uh, children at the age of six, for example, they will usually stay in the wheelchair if instructed to. And we keep the patients non-weight bearing for the first six weeks, of course, and then we gradually reintroduce uh, weight bearing over the next six weeks period, uh, normally advising the patient to use crutches and we, apply, uh, we have physiotherapists uh, working with them, gradually introduce uh, uh, weight bearing. Yes, and as you can see in, uh, in the material that we have presented in the articles, um, there were no signs of instability after the first two weeks. The only two cases that we have presented so far <laughs> happened early. And that was in one case due to the fall and the second case due to the, to the original osteotomy not being stable from the start. So we believe that once the screws are in the correct place and catch the graft, as long as the patient will not fall on the hip, um, it will probably stay stable. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for the answers uh, to these questions. And again, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want to remind the audience that uh, please remember to subscribe to Biotech Specialist a newsletter to maintain all the relevant news, what's happening in Biotech, all the studies that's coming out, and all the webinars that are coming in 2021. Uh, Dr. Leonard, uh, Dr. Hedelin, thank you again for your time and uh, presentation about the Salter Innominate Osteotomy and your studies. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for having us.